Welcome to Worship with New Life United Methodist Church. I'm glad you've joined us today. I'm away from town, out on vacation, so today we're going to be hearing from Brad Caligen, the lead pastor of Cornerstone Church. It's United Methodist Ministry in the Grand Rapids area. He'll be preaching on, Hey God, I'm in shock. Quite appropriate. So let us pray. Lord, meet us right where we are at. Touch us with your love, all those places we need it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My life flows on in endless song Above earth's lamentation I hear
Hello, do you ever feel afraid? I know I do sometimes. Do you ever feel anxious? I know I have. Oh, what does anxious mean? Well, it means experiencing worry and unease or nervousness, typically about something that you're not sure how it's gonna turn out. Yep, that is definitely me sometimes. When are you anxious? When school is first starts? When you have to sing or play your instrument in front of a bunch of people? When you don't know anyone you're sitting with in your classroom? I know that lately I have been anxious and worried sometimes about all the strange stuff we have to do because of this disease called COVID-19. But if I stop a minute and take a deep breath, I think about this one story in the Bible about Jesus and his disciples. So let me tell it to you. So one day, Jesus is with his disciples and he says, hey, let's go to the other side of the lake. And they're all like, yeah, we're in, let's go. So they're sailing along and Jesus decides to take a nap. Well, pretty soon they're not just sailing along. Oh my gosh, it is a big, big storm. Oh, the wind is howling. The waves are so big, they're getting water in the boat. The disciples went and woke Jesus up and said, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Jesus got up and he told the storm to stop. They were saved. Just like the disciples, we forget that we have Jesus with us and he can help us through those times when we are anxious and afraid if we ask him. Now, Jesus didn't drain the water out of the boat, but he made it so that the disciples could do that themselves. This is how Jesus helps us. Sometimes he takes away completely what we're anxious about, but other times he doesn't. And if we call on him, he'll help us to deal with whatever this is that's making us anxious. He helps us just like he helped the disciples. So let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, for being there when I need you. Help me to not forget that you are always there for me. Amen. I trust in the Lord for protection. So why do you say to me, fly like a bird to the mountains for safety? The wicked are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows on the bowstrings. They shoot from the shadows at those whose hearts are right. The foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? But the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord still rules from heaven. He watches everyone closely, examining every person on earth. For the righteous Lord loves justice. The virtuous will see his face. Hey, Cornerstone Church and other friends around the country or maybe even around the world, we're so glad you're here. Welcome to week 57 of sheltering at home. Doesn't it feel that way? Actually, this is only week six of online church, but I hope you're doing really well. One young husband I talked to this week and just asked him how he was doing said, you know, it's been interesting since we've been home. My wife and I have not had any strife. And I think maybe he was surprised at that. I hope maybe you are connecting with family members uh, like never before and you have a deeper appreciation for the people that you uh, live with. But I also am aware that I'm sure maybe your children uh, are really ready to play with somebody else. And, uh, and probably there are some homes that are, are just much more tense right now uh, because of being so close. I was disappointed to hear that domestic abuse is up significantly in Kent County and I hope that's not your case. You know, COVID-19 uh, is, is no laughing matter. 
But I always think, I get that, but I think having a sense of humor is one way of coping. And so, for instance, Colleen uh, snapped a shot of me this week trying to do a little bit of a home workout. Take a look. So you're okay laughing at me. Uh, All right, here's one for you. Okay, raise your hand right there where you are if you got to the living room late today or tonight or tomorrow. Um, and then last, here's, a, here's another, one more picture just in honor of Easter and Photoshop. Take a look. I hope that you know that I'm not making light of anything because our first responders and our medical folks are out there putting their, literally their life on the line every single day and Some of you have been touched by the virus in some way, maybe uh, through your own family or through an extended relative's family or a friend. Uh, I think we've all been struggling in different ways. But I think throughout this time, since it started a few weeks ago, uh, we've all struggled with also with fear. We've struggled with isolation and uncertainty and the possibility of sickness and and maybe even death. And... um, those kind of emotions just begin to wreak havoc, I think, on, on well-being and normal living and even mental health. A couple of weeks ago, USA Today carried an article, and in it they quoted this clinical psychologist, and she said this, this quote, the things that we rely on for stability in our lives are all under siege. You know, there's a, a lot of different ways to deal with emotions. I can think of two of them. One of them is... If you're experiencing things that you haven't really experienced for a long time or maybe ever before and you're having all these things kind of come up on the inside, psychologists also say to be able to name it is to tame it. And I think that's really important to begin to talk to somebody else about some of the things you're feeling and you're going through. The other thing, I think, is to look at it spiritually. And that's what this series is going to be all about. We're going to turn to the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, that's full of human emotion of all different kinds. You know, when you look at the Psalms, it is full of heartfelt cries and full of songs and full of prayers where people just lift up their hearts to the Lord and they say everything possible to the Lord. And, and it's also full of praise and worship at the same time. So we're going to look at six Psalms over these uh, next few weeks. And I, the really cool thing is that our faith development team and our groups people have put together Uh, an online study guide so your small group or your life group can uh, can get together virtually and um, and do this study together we can still come together as a church and I think that's so important right now if you're not in a group and you'd like to participate uh, check out the message discussion guide that'll be on the app or on the website and also check out both website and Facebook pages for ways that you can engage actually through zoom or some other means with some other people. But these six Psalms will help us wrestle with issues like sadness and, um, and, and just struggles of all kinds and even surrender and, and how to get a new start out of this. And some of the things that uh, all of us are thinking about, how do we actually serve other people? And so we're going to wrestle with all those kind of emotions. But today, let's dig in with the first one. Hey, God, I'm in shock. I know that the shock stage uh, hit just a few weeks ago when we were all told that we needed to stay in our homes. And it produces a kind of a panic when you can't do the things you've always done. I understand that. And so one of the Psalms that came to my mind was Psalm 11. It's a very short Psalm, just seven verses. And if you take a look at it, it's attributed to David. If you remember, David was the king of Israel from about a thousand uh, BC to about 950. He ruled for about around 40 years and he had an enormous dynasty at the time. But it starts out like this In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, Flee like a bird to the mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows, they set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadow at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? This is a psalm of panic. I don't know if you feel it. Maybe I didn't read it exactly like that, but it's a, it's a psalm of distress. 
It gives words to the shock that we all feel and felt when COVID-19, this pandemic, uh, hits our, our world and then our nation and then our state and all the implications that go with it. It's a little bit difficult to ascertain exactly what were the circumstances of this psalm, but here's what we think was going on. Uh, David's words kind of start out the psalm, in, in the Lord I seek refuge. The, the NLT says, in the Lord I look for protection. And then he begins to quote his counselors, his advisors that are all around him, kind of like his cabinet, because they're giving him all kinds of advice. He says, why do you say to me, flee like a bird to the mountains? The wicked are bending their bows and their arrows and they're ready to launch in your direction. These are the voices of panic that David hears in his ears. And in some ways it reminds me maybe of the media today and some other things. The voices all around us that just scare us and constantly we're seeing the updates and, and the fear begins to build inside of us. It very well might be that there was infiltration into the palace of some enemies who had worked their way in, had all the credentials, but they were out to get David because he says they, they were about to shoot their arrows out of the shadows. It's very likely that there was a, an assassin in the palace or maybe even more than one. And his advisors were saying, you better head for the hills, go to some mountain retreat, flee like a bird. And then comes the phrase that really caught my attention. The advisors say, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? One translation says, when the foundations of law and order collapse, what can the righteous do? This is an expression that uh, it just means all the things that you've always counted on just don't work anymore. I mean, the ability to go anywhere you want, to be as close to whoever you want to be close to, to have a job to go to, to have the economy that felt very, very stable, to stay healthy. These are the things that sort of make up the, the social order. And that's what his advisors said. The social order is collapsing, David. There are enemies in the palace. You got to get out of here. Now, from history, we know, you know, the social orders do collapse from time to time. They, they collapse during times of plague. They collapse during times of war. They collapse during times of coup d'etats. And his cabinet is saying, run, David, run. But David's thinking, if I run, what happens to the rest of the people? And so really the rest of the psalm, the next few verses... I just want to point out three things to do in a time of shock or a time of distress, a time of panic. And honestly, if you do these three things, there is a high likelihood that you will come through this whole thing that we're all experiencing right now stronger and deeper in, in connection to the Lord than ever before. So the first thing to do, David says, and I like this, he doesn't say it in so many words, is to stop ruling the world. Stop ruling the world. When you're overwhelmed with a crisis, just stop. The foundations are shaking all around you. David's advisors are advising him to leave. And, and David responds in verse 4. This is what he says. Just, just wait a minute. The Lord is in his holy temple. And the Lord is still on his heavenly throne. In other words, God hasn't abandoned anything. God hasn't abandoned me. God hasn't abandoned you during this time. God hasn't exited stage left or stage right. God's still on the throne, he's saying to the counselors. God's still there. God still rules from heaven. I just think, you know, over time, one of the most natural things to happen is when you and I are just going about our normal routines, and we can almost hardly remember it, but it's only been six or eight weeks ago. When we're in the normal course of life, I mean, we, we start kind of thinking that we're in control. I mean, we control 
kind of our family schedule. We control our kids' schedule to some degree. We control our money to some degree. We control our environment. We control where we live to some degree. A lot of us do. We control the people that we spend time with. We control a lot of things. And David said, when the foundations are shaking, you have this awareness that you were never really in control anyway. There's a great scene in a really uh, older movie called Kindergarten Cop, and some of you will remember this, about how we're really not in control anyway. Now write and say these words in which... Um, class, uh, Catherine, can you take a look at me, please? Thank you. He is the fifth letter of the alphabet. Can you read that one? Yes, can I help you? I have a problem. Mr. Campbell, I need to go real bad. First day? Yes. I'll take care of her. Thank you. No, kindergarten is like the ocean. You don't want to turn your back on it. Oh, they're okay. Don't worry. Everything is under control. No. Monsters. They are doing this. gonna break it up no two more days of this and you'll quit Start this. Oh no. Now I am not advocating that you yell, shut up at your kids. Don't do that. But don't you? Don't you feel that way sometimes? Like everything suddenly is out of control. I think as human beings, we lean towards self-sufficiency all the time and, and less reliance on the Lord. And we start going that direction and then something happens. And that's kind of what we just forget. This is my father's world. And that's what David is just trying to remind his counselors. Now, God's still on the throne, guys. Don't give up yet. You know, on Easter, we referred to a verse from Romans, Romans 8, 28. And the verse says, we know that in all things, God works for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But does that really work out? I mean, when you think about that, is it really true? I wonder, you know, when you're in the middle of some crisis, can you see how God's working this all out for good? Sometimes I've lost sight of it, but I'll tell you an example that I keep going back to. If I would have been one of the disciples on Friday and watched the Romans take my Jesus, who I thought was the Messiah, and hang him on a cross, and all the Jewish elders and leaders give their agreement to it, and Jesus, who... I've watched have all this power and can do all these miracles, does nothing to stop him. And he dies on that cross. And you watch all of your dreams like just come crashing down. The foundations were shaking and the disciples were going, what could the righteous do? They were probably quoting Psalm 11 right at that moment. But you know, Peter 
calls out what was really going on and he doesn't see it until just after the resurrection. It's 50 or 60 days later. In Acts chapter 4, verse 27, Peter is in the middle of a prayer and this is what he actually prays. He says, Herod and Pontius Pilate conspired with our leaders to put Jesus to death, but they were only doing what the Father planned for them to do. In other words, the authorities thought that they were ruling the world, but they weren't. God was working all things for good for those who love the Lord, even in the execution of his son. And that is true in every circumstance of our life. Now, I want to be really clear what you hear me say. And don't misunderstand me because I didn't say God was in control. Does not mean God sent COVID-19. Nor tornadoes in the south, or any other disasters. But nor does God stop every bad thing as well. You see, I think we live in a fallen world that sin has infected in so many ways. It's almost beyond imagination. God never sends evil, but God uses everything, the verse says, for good for those who love him. And you can count on that. And I get, I, I get it. It's a hard mystery to understand. But it's true nonetheless. God respects human free will and yet works at the same time to bless and never to curse. I think that's what being in control really means. It doesn't mean God moves all the pieces around all the time. It means God uses everything for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You know, there's an interesting story from history. It has to do with Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther from the 1500s, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther. And Martin Luther was the uh, kind of the leader, the spark of the Reformation from the Catholic Church. And he had a good friend named Philip Melanchthon. He was also a reformer, and they were sort of side by side in different cities working together in the Reformation. But Philip was more of an intellect and more of a scholar than Luther. But he was also given to anxiety and worry a lot. And he was always raising the flag like, Martin, we got to stop this. The foundations are shaking. The Pope is going to be coming in with his army, and he's going to behead us both. We have to get out of here. And And Martin had a saying that he said to Philip over and over. He'd say, Philip, stop trying to rule the world. Let God work through this. It's the same now. I know you're scared and I'm scared. And and we've had family and friends touched by this virus. And it is a horrible evil on the earth. And I don't know why it's happened. But I trust this. God's still on the throne. And he's still going to be working for good for those who love him. You and I are just underqualified to run the world. So stop ruling the world. The second thing the psalm says is to take the test. Take the test. Tests are not just for kids. And all the schools have ramped back up online learning right now. And so testing is going to be happening. But tests are for adults as well. Recently, I heard this story about a, a man from Africa, from Kenya or Tanzania, I'm not sure which, but he was a Maasai warrior. And he came to this country after graduating from a university in Africa to do his master's and his PhD here. And his classmates noticed that he had all kinds of <clears throat> excuse me, markings and scars on his body. And when they asked him about it, he told about the Maasai custom To become a man in his tribe, you had to be able to kill a lion with a spear. A feat that he had accomplished and he had passed the test of manhood, but it had left some scars on his body. I think when this current crisis is over, I think in some ways God will use this thing as a test for all of us. But I also think it's going to leave some scars. David was acutely aware that in every crisis, he could learn something about himself and something more about God. And so in verse 4, he finishes that thought by saying, God observes everyone on earth. 
His eyes examined them. The Hebrew wording of that literally means God uses everything as a test for his people. Again, let me say it again. God doesn't send bad things just to test us, but God uses everything, even hard things in our lives to purify us and to refine us and speak into us. God wants to do something in you in the middle of coronavirus 2020. I'm not sure what it is. I have to ask myself what's going on and what's happening in my own heart. And I hope you're asking that question as well. Because in times like this, we need to know ourselves. We need to maybe grow in some deeper ways to grow in our faith. Maybe God will put his finger on something in your life that's been a priority for you. And right now, it doesn't seem all that important. Are you passing the test? You know, in the Bible, God uses tests a lot of times with a lot of different people. And there's the Jonah test that's really a sin test that reveals his racism. And, but I, I was particularly thinking about the Job test. In the book of Job, you know, Satan comes to God and says, Hey, God, here's the thing. That guy that loves you says he loves you so much. He just loves you because of all the things you've given him. Just let me take some of those things away and we'll see if he really loves you. And the book of Job is about Satan just unleashing attack after attack on Job. And Job, I got to tell you, he wavers in the book. He goes back and forth, but he never breaks. And in the end, he finishes the book by saying, I know my Redeemer lives. He passes the test. You know, during this time, I believe if you can grow spiritually right now and start asking those honest questions of your own heart and your own soul just to see where your heart is right now, I believe you'll emerge out of this healthier and stronger than ever before. James wrote in the New Testament, consider it all joy, James backs all this up. He says, when you go through different trials and tests, because God is producing perseverance inside of you. What's God want you to learn through this? Does he want you to dig deeper in prayer than you've ever gone before? Does he want you to dig into his word? And maybe you've been a devotional reader or the occasional verse of the day, or maybe not even that. Is he asking you to trust him with your finances and continue to tithe or begin to tithe? And some of you have never trusted God with your tithe, 10%. Is he saying, I want you to reach out to some people beyond yourself right now and encourage some others? I believe that you will be spiritually happier and healthier. If you use this time, instead of turning to alcohol, that you'll turn to God. Instead of arguing with everybody in your family of loving them in some deeper ways. Instead of resorting to porn because you have more time on social media right now. To look to his word to instruct you and teach you. What's God want to do in you? What's the test? Are you passing the test? And then the last thing David says, I love this. The third, th the third discipline. Stop ruling the world. Take the test. And see his face. In times of distress, this is so, so important. The psalm ends where David says, the righteous or the virtuous will see his face. You'll see the face of God. What does it mean to see the face of God? You know, it doesn't, it goes beyond just simple prayer. We could write that off and go, oh, it just means pray more. No, it's more than that. There's a deeper sense here. It means to have communion with God, to, to come into his presence, to have a sense of his love around you, maybe in a deeper way than you've ever experienced before, just to enjoy God and to worship. There's a verse in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that struck me when I came across it. David was in the middle of thinking about building God this great temple, and he had a vision for this great temple. And Second Samuel seven eighteen says, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. That just struck me. It doesn't say David went in and 
got out his big agenda for prayer and says, God, you got to answer all these. I got this long list, and this is how I'm expecting you to work in my life. David doesn't do that. He just sat before the Lord. When's the last time you just sat before the Lord and just experienced communion with the Lord? Maybe even through some worship music or through repeating a verse from the Bible. You know, one of the great ways to meditate on God, maybe it's a phrase from the Lord's Prayer or a phrase from some other verse of the Bible. I love Psalm 91 that talks about just being in the shadow of the Almighty. Just to repeat that over and over and over and just sit in the presence of God and to see his face. Recently, I downloaded an app from an organization called Ransomed Heart, John and Stacy Eldridge, and on there they have some really rich prayers that I can turn on the audio and just listen to prayers in the morning. It just helps me just to see the face of God. And that also help, happens through music and, and some other ways. Maybe you found just a daily way to sit in the presence of God. I think it's so important. You know, with the shock of the news every single day and it keeps coming at us, the possibility of contracting this virus and all of us are doing everything we can to not have that happen and the, and the chance of even death that could happen. It almost feels like the foundations are shaking. And David would say, you know, you really weren't in charge of the world anyway. You might have thought you were. You might have felt like you had everything under control. And also, God is going to use this time. Didn't send it, but God's going to use this time as a test. And then last, the discipline is just to see his face. As a follower of Jesus, I never stick my head in the sand. I stay fully aware of what's going on. And at the same time, I choose hope. And I choose to look to the Lord for my help and my provision. I know who I am, and I want to know who the Lord is. It's a conscious choice, especially when the foundations are floundering all around us. What does God want to do in you? We want to introduce you to a new song, so I'm going to ask our musicians to come back, and the song we'll be singing over the next few weeks different on different weekends. And the song is called prophesy your promise and I want us to share the couple of the words from the first uh, verse of the song and and don't go away I want you I want you to let this these words just kind of wash over you and then I want to come back for just a final comment at the end the words go something like this I found you in the middle of my mess that sounds like Psalm 11 right there you had been there all along open arms and open heart. You called me in. You didn't hesitate at all. And the lies I once believed, they crumble with the weight of your truth. And the fear that gripped my heart is arrested so that I can see you. Experience this song together.
like to read the psalm. This is four verses one more time for you. So just hold that snack that you have in your hand right now. Come on back into the living room. I'd like you to, uh, to just be quiet. Maybe even close your eyes if that's doable in your setting right now. And listen to these words. I trust in the Lord for protection. So why do you say to me, fly like a bird to the mountains for safety? The wicked are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows into bowstrings. They shoot from the shadows at those whose hearts are right. The foundations of law and order are collapsing. What can the righteous do? But the Lord is in his holy temple and the Lord still rules from heaven. He watches everyone closely, examining every person on earth. For the righteous Lord loves justice, and the virtuous will see his face. As a result of hearing what you heard today through the music or through the message, is there a decision that you need to make? Have you been in control of a lot of things, and this has really helped you realize that's really God's job. We're underqualified to rule the world. Do you feel like you've been going through a testing time? How are you doing? Like Job, are you wavering but not breaking? Do you know that your Redeemer lives? And last, are you allowing yourself just to see God's face, taking those every moment you can to be quiet right now? And I know if you're in a home with a lot of little children, I get that it's tough and you're tired at night and I understand all that, but there's got to be a moment when you allow yourself to see the face of God. What decision do you need to make? Let's pray together. Holy God, sometimes we really believe that we can control our own destinies. We can can move this world forward if we just do our part right and then we realize it's really your job. I want to give you thanks for working good through everything, through the good, bad, and the ugly of our lives. You're at work in all of our people. You're at work in everyone who's listening today. Whether they're close to you or far from you, it doesn't matter. You're still at work. So draw us closer to you than ever before. And if there's a decision that someone's wrestling with it right now, may we be able to make it for you. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. A blessing from Psalm 20. May the Lord grant the desires of your heart and may he favorably look upon you through this time of sacrifice. God bless you and we'll see you next weekend.